So here we have a Whippany Rhythm Master, manufactured in 1977 according to the eBay listing. The wood grain finish is actually fake. Controls are pretty minimalist. Besides the 10 rhythms, the only other controls are volume and tempo. There's an output to the amplifier, control for a foot switch that mutes the playback. No user serviceable parts inside? Challenge accepted. We're going to MIDI mod this thing and bring it into the 21st century. Now before we even turn this thing on, let's open it up and make sure that it's going to be electrically safe. Since this is made in 1977, and who knows what's happened to it between then and now, the chassis is held to the outer box with screws that go through the four mounting feet. Once those are removed, the chassis just slides right out. Not a single integrated circuit on the whole device. Everything is done with discrete transistors, capacitors, and resistors. Let's take a look underneath the sound generation board and see what's on the sequence generation board. That's the sequencer on the lower board. It's made completely from discrete components like everything else in this device. Yeah, some of that wiring looks a little sketchy. But that's why we're in here, to uh, make sure we're not going to burn the house down when we mod this thing. The first mod I'm going to do, get rid of that captive plug and put a, an IEC power connector on the back. And add an inline fuse for safety. So I don't get metal shavings all over the circuit boards. I disconnected as much of everything as I could and, and folded it out of the way for better access to the metal on the chassis. Now to cut a slot for the new power connector. Almost done when the disc broke on the Dremel tool. But uh, a little wiggling with the pliers, and we were good. Connector fits perfectly fine. Now to mark some spots to drill holes to screw the connector down. That bit should be just about right. Oh look, a wire nut. This has got to go. First thing that gets added is the fuse. All the new connections we soldered and heat shrinked in place. Next is a grounding wire, while access is still easy to the middle pin on the IEC connector. And the final wire added will be a neutral. The other end of the fuse wire is soldered to the on-off switch, and heat shrink to cover. Look at this 120 volt exposed wire. Again, that's why we reopened it up before we turned it on. Looks like that exposed wire was connected to the power indicator light. That's going to be replaced with an LED later. I ended up desoldering and reattaching the wire that goes from the switch to the transformer just to get a better piece of heat shrink on there. And splicing the neutral wire to the transformer. With some more heat shrink, of course. Now let's do the good old smoke test. I have an amp clamp set up so that I can see how much current this thing draws, because that's not listed anywhere on it. And then I can put the, uh, a more appropriate fuse in the fuse holder. And contact. The clamp says 90 milliamps. It's in the 10x sensitivity slot on the plug adapter. So this machine only draws around 9 to 10 milliamps at 120 volts. And let's get a DC reading to see what kind of voltages the circuitry operates on. It looks to be around 12 volts. Now let's give all the sounds a listen before we do any more modifications to this unit. <laughs> 
so even without any buttons pressed, it still makes sounds. I'm going to have to add a way to disable the internal sequencer. So let's do some probing around to see what kind of pulses we need to inject into this thing so we can add some external controls and make our own rhythms. That looks like the trigger pulse that actually generates the sound. Now I did some more probing off camera and the trigger pulse for all the same instruments is identical, which is good because it's going to make injecting our own signals a lot easier. And it looks like the internal oscillator can be halted by interrupting the power to the tempo potentiometer, as this potentiometer looks like it just controls the charge rate of an oscillator circuit. With the lower the resistance, the faster the circuit charges. Now that we've explored the electronics in the Rhythm Master a little bit, let's talk about the circuit we need to build for this mini mod. Trigger pulses being sent to the soundboard are all generated with a circuit similar to this. A 47 nanofarad capacitor with two diodes making the pulse always a positive voltage. Now I can't hook this circuit directly to the output pin of a microcontroller because this trigger pulse needs to be 12 volts. Normally, you'd use a level shifter to step up the voltage. But I don't have any level shifters, but I have plenty of op amps. So with a negative feedback tied to a 2.5 volt reference and the positive input of each amplifier connected to the microcontroller, the op amp will saturate its output, generating the 12 volt pulse that is needed. The rest of the circuit is fairly straightforward voltage regulator to provide 5 volts, a crystal to keep the microcontroller at a predictable speed, and a standard MIDI input receiving circuit. Now let's build it. I like to lay out my chips and sockets first to get a feel for the spacing of the parts on the perf board. Once I like what I got, I start soldering them down. Next a small header to allow for in-circuit programming with a microcontroller and a power filtering capacitor. The crystal and its load capacitors. I added wires for the in-circuit programming neck so that they're out of the way. Voltage regulator and main power filtering caps. Pull-up resistor for the MIDI receiver. And here's a trick. If you have some low profile capacitors, you can sneak them into the gap in the middle of a chip socket. This makes the perf board just that much neater. Now a voltage divider for the 2.5 volt reference circuit. Lots of connections. Lots and lots of connections. This is why printed circuit boards are such a joy to work with. Now to lay out the output stage. Something like this. Seven times. Yeah. Now that the MIDI receiver board is done, we can go back and finish modding the chassis of the drum machine. I didn't want to do this earlier because I wanted to test it after I made it safe, before I put any additional effort into it. So we need a switch to stop the internal sequencer. And we need a hole for the MIDI jack. Drill time. A unibit will do nicely for that. A little sandpaper to take off the burrs. Now to add the attachment holes for the MIDI jack. And screw the jack in place. Getting rid of the shavings now that all the metal work is done. With the factory PCBs in place, I can add the MIDI receiver on a standoff. There really is a lot of extra room in this thing. Next, I added the program to the microcontroller. Soldered the connections to the MIDI jack. Added the plus 12 volts and ground connections. and added a connection from each output of the MIDI receiver board to the input of each sound generator. If you couldn't tell before now, this drum machine can make seven unique sounds. 
Now to route the 12 volt connection from the tempo potentiometer through the switch that was added on the back. Power indicating LED was added off camera, and with that the mods are done. While I was poking around I noticed you could make some adjustments to the sounds. The yellow potentiometer on the right controlled the pitch of the white noise. The first green pot controlled the amount of noise and the snare sound. The middle green pot controlled the pitch of the snap and clap sounds. And the one on the left controlled the tone of the kick drum. Because I adjusted the sounds, I listened to all the built-in rhythms again to see how they sounded. Now let's see what this can do with a MIDI sequence piped in. And finally, since I know everything works, chassis can go back in the housing. And we can call this reckless experiment a success. Hope you all enjoyed.